Hello everyone, welcome back and thank you for tuning in. Genitourinary syndrome of menopause or GSM refers to a range of signs and symptoms that occur due to decrease in estrogen and other sex hormones. It is a chronic condition that tend to worsen with age, so long-term approach is key. These changes can affect the labia, clitoris, vestibule, vagina, urethra and bladder. If you want to know more about the prevalence of GSM and its impact on the quality of life and how it is diagnosed, watch this video. In this video, I will cover the current evidence on various treatment options, including hormonal and non-hormonal therapies, laser and energy-based devices, as well as alternative and complementary therapies for healthy postmenopausal women. In a future video, I will focus specifically on treatment options for women with breast cancer, hormone-sensitive cancers, and those at high risk. The positive effects of treatment on quality of life are significant and should not be overlooked. International surveys indicate that healthcare providers need to take the initiative to discuss symptoms with their patients and offer safe, effective treatment options. For instance, the Vaginal Health Insights, Views and Attitudes, or the VIVA International Survey, revealed that 46% of postmenopausal women are unaware of local estrogen therapy. Both local vaginal and systemic estrogen therapies are effective treatment options for women experiencing moderate to severe GSM, and they can be used together for enhanced relief. Estrogen helps to lower vaginal pH, promote capillary growth, improve vaginal tissue health, and restore vaginal secretions and flora. Local vaginal estrogen has demonstrated proven safety and efficacy. These are available as vaginal tablets, creams, rings, pessaries, and ovules. Clinical studies on low-dose preparations aimed at minimizing side effects have been published by both a Cochrane Review and the European Menopause and Andropause Society. It's important to discuss the risk and benefit of each option with your health provider to tailor the treatment to your individual needs. It is also important to note that licensed products vary widely from country to country, so check with your local authority. So what does the evidence show regarding safety and effectiveness? A 2006 Cochrane review found that all forms of local vaginal estrogen are equally effective. There is some absorption of local vaginal estrogen, which can vary based on the dosage and the extent of vaginal thinning. Initially, absorption may increase when vaginal tissues are thin, but it tends to decrease with continued use. For example, long-term use of 10 micrograms of estradiol tablet does not result in plasma estrogen levels exceeding the normal postmenopausal range of less than 20 picograms per mil and it does not increase the risk of endometrial hyperplasia or carcinoma. This is why a progestogen is not necessary when these products are used at recommended doses. However, it is important to note that conjugated equine estrogen cream has been associated with endometrial stimulation. Now, a special note on estriol. Estriol, also known as E3, is a naturally occurring weak estrogen found in low levels in the body. It is usually made from our own body's estradiol and estrone. In some countries, vaginal estriol is regulated by the government for the treatment of symptoms associated with GSM. It was first approved as oral capsules in the 1930s, but it has not received FDA approval in the United States. A 2017 literature review indicated that the quality of evidence from studies on estriol was low to moderate, as it included randomized controlled trials and quasi-experimental studies. The review found evidence for its efficacy and safety of estriol in treating GSM. However, estriol levels increased shortly after use, but did not remain elevated at the six-month follow-up. The need for better quality and long-term safety data, particularly for women with a history of hormone-sensitive conditions, remains unclear. Before moving away from estrogen therapy, I want to specifically discuss uncomplicated recurrent urinary tract infections in postmenopausal women. In 2019, the American Urological Association, or AUA, released guidelines for managing recurrent uncomplicated urinary tract infections, or UTIs, in women. 
These guidelines recommended that in peri- and postmenopausal women with uncomplicated UTIs, clinicians should suggest vaginal estrogen therapy to help reduce the risk of future UTIs, provided there are no contraindications to estrogen therapy. Now, let's move on to the newer kid on the block, vaginal DHEA. Vaginal dehydroepiandrosterone, or DHEA, also known as prasterone, is a medication that was approved by the FDA in 2016 for treating GSM. In the United States, it is marketed under the brand name Intrarosa and is used as a daily tablet inserted vaginally. Prasterone has shown to significantly improve symptoms of GSM, including painful intercourse and vaginal pH levels. It is generally well tolerated with minimal absorption into the bloodstream, allowing hormone levels to remain in the normal range of the postmenopausal women. The most common side effects is vaginal discharge, which occurs as the medication melts at body temperature. Prasterone is at least as effective as vaginal estrogen treatments in improving symptoms and sexual function. However, the long-term safety profiles for women with cardiovascular disease, history of blood clots, and hormone-sensitive cancers are not well established. Currently, there are no direct head-to-head -head studies comparing vaginal DHEA with local vaginal estrogen. Both treatments appear to be effective for managing GSM. The difference is vaginal estrogen is typically used twice a week, while DHEA is used daily and may be more expensive, which could affect its practicality for some patients. Before moving on to non-hormonal therapies, let's finish off with two oral medications that can improve GSM, Tibolone and Ospamivine. Tibolone is an oral synthetic steroid drug that has estrogenic effects on the vagina without affecting the endometrium. It is not approved in the US, but is used in Europe and across the Asia Pacific. Its use has been linked to significant improvements in vaginal dryness, sexual function, nocturia, and urinary urgency among postmenopausal women. For more detailed information about Tibolone, please watch this video. Additionally, to learn more about Tibolone's specific effects in Asian women, be sure to tune in to this video. Ospemaphine is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, or SERM, that is approved for use in the United States and Europe to treat moderate to severe GSM. A 12-week randomized controlled trial demonstrated that ospemaphine was well tolerated for alleviating vaginal dryness and dyspareunia and it proved to be more effective than lubricants. Safety studies involving over 1,000 women who took 60 mg per day orally for up to one year did not report any cases of endometrial cancer, with endometrial hyperplasia occurring in less than 1% of participants. However, ospemaphine is not suitable for women who are at high risk of blood clots or have had clots in the veins, lungs, or retina. Generally, estrogen therapy, tibolone, and ospemaphine should be avoided in women with the following conditions. Breast cancer or other hormone-sensitive cancers, unexplained vaginal bleeding, endometrial hyperplasia or cancer, allergies to any ingredients used in the estrogen products. Caution is also advised for women with the following risk factors. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, liver problems, heart disease, smoking, especially over the age of 35, migraines with neurological symptoms, and acute gallbladder or bile duct inflammation. Let's talk about non-hormonal therapies. The North American Menopause Society recommends that non-hormonal vaginal lubricants and moisturizers should be considered first-line treatments. A combination of these products can be used regularly during intercourse to alleviate symptoms of vaginal dryness. However, they do not reverse vaginal tissue thinning. Lubricants are typically used on an as-needed basis during sexual activity and can be water-based, oil-based, or silicon-based. It's important to note that petroleum-based products and baby oil may compromise the integrity of condoms. In contrast, moisturizers are used regularly and often contain a bioadhesive polymer such as polycarbophol, which adheres to mucin and epithelial cells on the vaginal wall to retain moisture. Many moisturizers today also contain hyaluronic acid, which has a similar function. 
Comparative studies have demonstrated that these moisturizers can achieve similar efficacy to estrogen treatments in reducing itching, irritation, and dyspareunia. So what about laser and energy-based devices? Research into vaginal treatments has primarily focused on fractional CO2 lasers, which have been shown to effectively improve GSM. The Erbium YAG laser has also been studied, though with less supporting data. A 2023 meta-analysis and systematic review involving over 200 participants indicated a high risk of bias and low to moderate quality of evidence regarding the use of energy-based devices. The findings suggested that CO2 laser treatments are a safe option. However, several gaps, including the limited number of RCTs, small sample sizes, and high risk of bias need to be addressed. Another 2023 review by the European Urogynecological Association found that both lasers produce similar results to alleviating symptoms of GSM and improving quality of life. But despite numerous publications, there are currently no RCTs with adequate control groups, clear inclusion criteria, or standardized protocols with long-term follow-up to validate their effectiveness and safety. I will explore how laser treatments compare to non-hormonal options in a future video, so be sure to stay tuned. Finally, what's the evidence on alternative and complementary therapies? Research has shown that soy-rich diets does not significantly improve urogenital symptoms or restore vaginal health in perimenopausal and postmenopausal women. Additionally, supplementation with genistin at a dose of 54 mg per day for 12 months did not yield improvements in vaginal epithelium compared to placebo. Similarly, black cohosh, whether used alone or as part of a multi-ingredient product, had no observable effects on the vagina, endometrium, or reproductive hormone levels. Other herbal alternatives including red clover, donggui, wild yam, chaseberry, cat's claw, chamomile, calendula flower, ginkgo biloba, and green tea, whether used alone or with plant oils, also lack efficacy. The next alternative may surprise you. Sea buckthorn oil. I have never heard of this until my friend Alvina Fu, an integrative pharmacist, mentioned this. She's my go-to expert for all drug, herb, nutrient, condition interactions. A 2014 RCT involving 166 postmenopausal women suffering from moderate to severe vaginal dryness, burning or itching were asked to take 3 grams of sea buckthorn oil daily orally for 3 months. A gynecologist assessed vaginal health by measuring parameters such as vaginal pH, moisture, and epithelial integrity. The findings found improvement in epithelial integrity, however, the improvement in symptoms were deemed non-significant. Notably, the C. buckthorn group presented with higher levels of joint pain at baseline, which was difficult to account for and may have affected the final outcomes. The authors acknowledged limitations in the study sample size and duration but concluded that C. buckthorn oil does not exhibit estrogenic activity. It may serve as a potential option for women contraindicated for hormone therapies. Nonetheless, this study does not permit any definitive conclusions. Probiotics are trending. So what's the evidence? Lactobacillus, the predominant vaginal probiotic, plays a role in metabolizing glucose derived from glycogen in the vaginal wall into lactic acid and acetic acid which lowers vaginal pH to the range of 3.5 to 4.5. This acidity provides natural protection against urinary tract infections, vaginal inflammation, and inhibits the growth of pathogenic bacteria. However, the evidence for using lactobacilli on its own in the vagina for women with moderate to severe GSM is inconclusive. But a 2013 RCT of 87 postmenopausal women using a combination of lactobacillus and ultra-low-dose estriol for 12 weeks improved vaginal symptoms, suggesting a potential for synergistic effect. In summary, there is a need for awareness, appropriate discussion between patients and their healthcare providers, and a tailored holistic approach to managing GSM and enhancing the quality of life for postmenopausal women. In future videos, I will delve deeper into the specific treatment guidelines for women with breast cancer, other hormone-sensitive cancers, and women at high risk. Thanks again for watching. If you found this video helpful, please like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for updates. See you in the next video.